Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Dan Ratner. I'm here on Crushing Doubt with John Gribben, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Curable. Now, John, I'm just going to briefly introduce what Curable is for the very few people who might not know, because actually most people who come to me do know what Curable is. But Curable is a tech company. It was started in 2017. Do I have that right? Uh, pretty much. Late 2016, yes. Okay, late 2016. Okay. Um, and they have a software app that provides a collection of some of the best up-to-date research on mind-body experience and also delivers a therapy program to people with chronic pain. I know there's lots of other things on Curable, and you can fill us in on that. But um, what we're going to do today, just for the viewing audience, is that I'm going to interview John in the way that I tend to interview people when they come on other mind-body professionals. We're going to hear about his story with mind-body issues, how he came to all this work. And as we go through that, we're then going to move to the second half, which will be a Q&A, where you can direct questions to me, you can direct them to John, you can direct them to us both. And we may both choose to comment on them as well. So for those of you out there who haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, put your comments below. But I am very excited to have you here, John. Um, I know a lot about Curable. I talked, I believe, to Laura, actually, one of your other co-founders. Yes. Uh, oh, years ago. Yes. And she, she said to me, wow, you're like as excited about this as like Sarno was, which I am. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. What, I, what I'm like. And I know you, you guys have a lot of energy for this too. So when I do these interviews, the place that I usually like to start is to hear about your experience with mind body issues. And I should say this, you made a great point before we came on here. We don't have a great term for what we call this. Sarno calls it TMS. Some other people like Howard Schubiner and Dave Clark call it PPD. Uh, some people call it MBS. I tend to just call it mind-body issues or maybe even just the human experience. It's right. <laughs> Yes, indeed. It, it is the human experience. It's pretty, it's pretty hard to pin down what, what it is. So could you tell us about your journey with mind-body experience? When did it, when did it really begin for you? The, the, the symptoms, I guess, is where it starts. Yeah, isn't it interesting that you... Um, uh, it's 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 folks who are in this space like you and me and are kind of dedicating their careers or professional lives to helping people and and who are in the space it is almost um assumed that you've had the personal experience yourself prior to um getting involved professionally and, and that's certainly the case with me um i i started feeling back pain when i was in my late teens i um you know had just kind of crushing back pain as a, in, when I was starting 19, 20 years old and um, progressively worse through my 20s. I got a diagnosed early in my 20s, uh, you know, MRI orthopedic uh, diagnosed me with a, a herniated disc. Um, and that's what I assumed was the issue. Um, the orthopedic who diagnosed me kind of you know, asked me, well, have you sustained any injuries recently? I said, no. What about last year? No. Okay. Anytime in the last 10 years, I was like, well, I got in this car accident when I was, you know, 14. And he's like, yeah, that's what it is. That's, that's where your bulk, your herniated disc came from. So that's what I went about in my twenties thinking I had a herniated disc from a car accident that, um, that gave me a lot of back pain. Uh, you know, I think now we know, now that I know the full story, I, I remember instances of severe neck pain. Um, I remember instances of sciatica, both legs, both sides of my back, um, really bad shoulder pain to the point where I went to uh, the physician and they died. They basically said, yeah, I had to get rotator cuff surgery. Uh, so I, there are a lot of these mind, body, life experience um, issues, symptoms that I had. Um, but the back was the main one. And then in my mid early thirties, still a lot of back pain, doing everything, PT, massage, injections, topical creams, uh, you know, oral medication, over the counter prescription, um, never surgery, fortunately. Uh, but I was to the point again, where I needed to go in and get it looked at again. It was just driving me crazy. It was getting worse and worse in my thirties and, uh, and went to Northwestern hospital huge reputable academic center and this time another mri this time diagnosed with degenerative disc disease 
So now we have two different diagnoses spanning 15 years for the same problem. Um, and I was in a state of panic really because, you know, degenerative disc disease, uh, the two words that were sticking out to me were disease, of course, I have a disease and degenerative, meaning it's only going to get worse from here. So right. when I walked out of the hospital that day and I'm thinking it's only going to get worse and I'm still in bad pain, it's only going to get worse than this. Uh, that's not good. Um, and, and things went on uh, for, you know, a period of time after that. And I, I don't know if you want me to stop the story there, the, the kind of to dive in on a little bit more to spend a little more time on because the, you know, for my viewers and my listeners, most of them are either in pain or they know somebody who's in pain and they're trying to find answers about it. So actually one thing I was thinking about my pain started, I had eight years of back pain and it began when I was 28 years old and, and you, yours started even younger. You're very precocious. Um, the, I, one of the things I felt was what's wrong with me that all of my friends are not having this kind of thing. And, and, What's going on with me? I couldn't really understand it. Was that part of what went on for you? I, did that cross your mind either in the in the period in your 20s or that period in your 30s where you heard about degenerative and disease? Was that part of your thought process? And if not, just tell me about the depths of things otherwise. I don't recall uh, viewing it from the perspective of why, you know, why me or why, why me and not somebody else? I kind of didn't, I guess, think of it as um, this point of differentiation uh, between me and kind of everybody else. Um, it certainly ruled my life to a large degree. I mean, it was, it was, it permeated everything I did from traveling or, or not um, to exercise. I was, I was probably as unhealthy as I've ever been in my life in my twenties when you're supposed to be your most healthy, um, to, I, you know, I went to, uh, law school in my twenties and, and the day before our, my first exam. So when in your first year of law school, it's like this really intense year, um, very stressful. They try to Yes. One L. Yes. You know the term. They intentionally try to put a lot of heat on you. And um, and going into my fir our first set of exams the day before the back blows out. Of course, now I can link that to what was going on in my life. <clears throat> but at the time, it was my back. Oh, what an inopportune time. What a coincidentally inopportune time. And so, you know, I had to deal with that and sit in an exam like on a, without a heating pad. So it it was it was all encompassing in my life that that part i do remember um not necessarily a um why did the pain gods choose me but more you know, like boy this is i can't believe that this is pretty much involved in everything i do well it's funny because i i even now i i talk to people about their stories and my story and and i realize some of some of my story was idiosyncratic to me that was immediately where i went and I hear it for you, that's not where you went at all, but you did have the depths of the problem anyway. It was dominating your life. And, and that, that's a phrase that I definitely could apply to my experience. I used to wake up and the first thought I had was, how is my back? And I would go to sleep. And the first, and the last thought I had was, how is my back? And if I and, was and, as and in the night. Sleeping certain ways, I would sleep only on my left side of my body so that, because I had pictured my spine then curving the way that opens up the discs to let that nerve, you know, so I, I slept in on my left side, which was the shy I was trying to expand for 12 straight years. How many nights is that? I haven't even done the math, but it's thousands of nights in a row. No wonder my left shoulder was after it all. <laughs> right. That's funny. My, mine was my right. I could not sleep on my left side oh, for, yeah, for yeah. years. Um, and it, and it, I don't think I regained that function probably for the full eight years. So tell me about the depths, the depths of it when you were really in it. And it sounded like it got worse when you went in in your 30s and got that degenerative um, disease, those words mm -hmm. pounding in on you. What was what was was that the worst time? I, I would say that is that was the worst time that diagnosis. I, I went in because um, my wife. Uh, 
it was a winter. We, we, I li we lived in Chicago, just brutal winters. Um, and, you know, it was month four of another brutal winter. And I was, you know, just going kind of stir crazy. And the pain was getting deeper and deeper. And I'm guessing those were probably related in some way to, you know, the just the stress of being inside and the cold and um, and not necessarily the temperature is what I'm saying, but, you know, the the being being sad <laughs> seasonal effect. Yes. Yeah, um, right. And and so she was like, you got to go, you know, please go in and get this looked at. You're just in in brutal shape. And and so that's what prompt. So I was already at a low enough point where someone who cared about me and loved me was saying, you got to go back in. Uh, and then I go in and get the diagnosis that what I now know is a, a garden variety diagnosis. But at the time, I didn't know that. And I heard those words. And um, and I would say that that was the that was the lowest it got. And I remember where I was when I walked out of Northwestern Hospital in Streeterville. It's a downtown Chicago and looked around and just had this degeneration bouncing around in my head saying, like, today's the best day for the rest of right. my life. You know, um, <clears throat> so that was that was the low point. OK, so let's fast forward to when you when you hit on the solution in any way. When did you it was Sarno you first heard about? Is that right? Yes. Yes. And how did that how did that happen? Well, we I, I don't remember if it was a few months after that or or a year or two after that diagnosis. But um, my wife and I were buying our first home as you know, 30 somethings in Chicago. And it was a it was a real seller's market. So we were buyers and you know had to give up everything to you know bidding war and everything to to buy a house. Um, and as part of this bidding war, we gave our it was like you have you know two weeks to close your mortgage and close on this whole thing and and it was just a really stressful period for us being our first time and and then um, and this mortgage timeline and um, and then. We get to the end and the day before we're supposed to close the entire basement of this house which was finished i was like part of the draw of the house was this nice finished basement the entire basement of the house floods with like toilet water sewage water the, the night i mean it was literally the night before we were going to close so um that was just a big thing and fixing all that and still trying to close in the house and then moving stuff in but not everything in the to this basement, which is like half the square footage of the house. Like it was a hard uh, week. And then, you know, of course, um, I have a major back episode about four days after closing. And I, of course, attributed it to um, the fact that I was moving, like moving from one house to another in flip flops. Um, but when I really think about it, I like we hired movers. I barely moved. Um, I think I moved like my computer and like a backpack. And I don't know why, how flip flops could have influenced, um, you know, my pain at that time. But, but anyway, that's what I attributed it to. Um, not of course the stress of the last four weeks of this mortgage and everything else. And, and it, it put me in, in bed for two, three, four days. Um, I finally got out and we had a trip planned with uh, our family, our kids to Maine the following weekend. And, um, and we made it, I made it, got the kids, got the family to Maine. Still it's ginger, it wasn't in full blowout mode, but it was improving, but slowly. And I went, we were, um, we had some friends in Maine and I went on a walk on a hike with a friend of mine named Tony. And he asked me, you know, how's your back? I said, that, don't, I don't want to talk about it. And he said, no, I'm asking because I, I used to have back pain. I said, okay, what do you mean you used to? And he said, well, I used to, I had back pain and I, and I read this book and, um, and I'm feeling like better. And I, I honestly, Dan, normally I would have said, thanks a lot. But in this case, I really believe it was, and this is, you know, how important this is. It was the messenger, Tony, who actually, it was, that made the difference to me. Tony is not the kind of person who is into, you know, woo woo, like, you know, kind of magic. He's in a science. And, and if he kind of bought into what he was saying, I was willing to listen. 
And so we spent the next 20 minutes on this hike. He basically gave me the cliff notes of um, Mind Over Back Pain by Sarno. And in just in giving me the cliff notes, I went, this is me. This is, this is my story. This applies to me. My pain didn't go away altogether, but boy, I was a different person at the end of the walk than I was at the beginning of the walk. Uh, as far as hope, as far as the, how the pain felt, um, and that was the kind of kickoff of me going down my own path to, to getting better. It, it, you hit on so many great points. I just want to highlight a couple of them. One, it really is, it, it matters who the messenger is. So if Tony had come to you and said, I have these magic crystals and they helped me and I read this book, you'd be like, no, 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 no. I'm right. like, I cannot interact with you that way. So the messenger does really matter. And I also... I, I shared a lot in common with you about these things that, um, first of all, Sarno was essentially, my messenger originally was my chiropractor and he had worked on my back pain for, for years. And I think eventually he was like, well, some people get help from this Sarno character. And I was like, oh my God, a book on back. I was so skeptical. Mm -hmm. And I like to share that with most people uh, yeah. because it it's a part of the experience, but when I saw the description of me, it was so clear and it, and it, and coming from a medical doctor also that really helped. So I want to get to, to more in a sec. I just want to talk to our audience for a second, remind them to, uh, hit subscribe, uh, hit like, if you like what you're hearing, P uh, ring the bell for notifications and put your comments below. And actually don't be shy about putting your questions into the chat for John and I now. We'll see them and we will get to them. So no no need to wait until we're done talking. No need for politeness here. Um, we, we're excited to talk to you. So John, now I wanna I wanna jump back to your story. You heard of the cliff notes, and then when you read it, what, what well, did you start to get relief just from that cliff notes conversation with Tony? Or did yeah. you yeah, is not that full relief, but but I definitely like I said, I I felt symptom relief on the walk alone. Yes. Yeah. And did what you I really remember is not necessarily like measuring my pain on a scale of zero to 10. It was hope. I, I, I had this just flash on, in talking with my friend that perhaps I might have been wrong all along because my, I, all along, I believed the generation, this is going to be me for the rest of my life. And there was this glimmer of hope in talking to my friend that I might have been wrong, that, that maybe one day, it might not be today, but one day I might actually not have back pain. And that's what yeah, I heard. It was fleeting. It, it lasted, I think, a, two seconds. Like it didn't, it wasn't like I, right. oh, the whole rest magically of better right away. Like thinking about this, it just kind of came and went, but I do distinctly remember that moment. But, you know, you also said this thing about hearing Tony say he had back pain and you were like, what do you mean? Like the past tense of back pain is so foreign to chronic pain sufferers. When I, I heard of, that's when I originally went to this chiropractor, I heard this woman say I had back pain. I was like, what do you mean you had back pain? Because we're used to the, the story in our own narrative where we have back pain and then we just have it. Uh, for chronic pain sufferers, they just have it the whole time. So the that past tense thing is very important. Now, oh, Dan, I mean, as you, as you know, and maybe we'll talk about this, but even your family, friends, your loved ones, you know, becomes part of your identity as, as you know, um, both oh, your yeah. own, your own inward identity, as well as your outfacing identity. And I still have like my mother-in-law to this day. Now this is, you know, 10 years removed is like, if I'm lifting something, she goes, Oh, you're back. I know. Like, oh, I know. That was, that's, I'm that's, totally fine now. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Yeah, the, that's yeah. People it. think of me as having back pain, even though I haven't had it for over ten years. Right. Right. Um. So tell me, um. I was reading something on you, and and the, some of the idea of curable came to you by the thought: Why don't people know about this? That's the main. I went. Concept. Yeah. Because I went for years, and I had the same thought: Why did no one? in my life know about this you know it wasn't like people brought it up and i was skeptical no one brought it up so tell us how the idea of curable came to be from that question 
essentially. The, the, I, okay. <laughs> if I phrase that not well. No, no. I, thinking of the, the, or, I'm looking back and thinking of the order of things. And that question became the centerpiece of Curable. Mm -hmm. It became the founding thesis of why we started the company. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually still the centerpiece of Curable mm -hmm. and the mission. Um, but there is there is a little bit, there's some key events that actually took place before asking ourselves that question. Um, okay. And it was really the meeting of my two co-founders, um, Eric and Laura, who also suffered many years of chronic pain, variety of symptoms. Um, we like to say that between among the three of us, we've had decades of chronic pain and dozens of symptoms. Um, and it's true. Uh, and so, so the three of us met professionally at a, at a technology company in Chicago. And then um, when we were, we, we left that company and, and got together because we wanted to start something. We wanted to start a company together. We kind of felt that we had these um, complementary skill sets and, and, so, and we enjoyed each other's company and, and we wanted to, um, to start something. And you know, we were, we had this makeshift office that we would meet at, you know, a couple of times a week to, you know, start thinking of ideas and things. And during this time, um, my, my mother um, had hip pain and she lived in Chicago and she, um, she was like, what was that book you read that, you know, your, your made your back feel better? I told her about the book. She read Sarno. She's like, yeah, this is me too, but I'm not feeling all better from, doing my own work, I kind of want the help of somebody else. So I think she might even Googled Sarno Chicago and, um, and found our friend now, our Curable's very good friend, um, but at the time, uh, kind of, you know, a, a physician at, uh, at, at Northwestern named Dr. John Sarno, or uh, sorry, Dr. John Strax. Hello yeah. to Dr. Strax. I'm sure you know Dr. Strax, Dan. I um, do, I do, I love him. And so my mother goes to see Strax and um, and she gets better. We're, we're working with Strack, working through, we're, you know, having that guide through her process in Dr. Strax. And she becomes like a Strax groupie, my mom does. And so she's like going, he has these like quarterly things where he brings patients in, they tell their stories, and she, my mom's going to all these things. And so Laura and Eric and I had this makeshift office, and we're thinking of what to, how to start a company, what to do. And my mom invites me to one of her Strax groupie parties and I go down to Northwestern hospital and he has, you know, dozens and dozens of people in a room. And these people are telling their stories of like overcoming their chronic pain. And it was like incredibly moving to me. And I remember going back into our makeshift office the next day saying, I, I went to this thing last night, no matter what we do, um, it's got to be as meaningful as what this guy at Northwestern is doing. And then we went, yeah, 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 onto that other idea that we had and like started <laughs> whiteboarding that. Um, and all the while, about every third, every fourth meeting we would have in our office, Laura would be absent. She would miss it because she would, you know, text us and say, oh, I have a migraine today. My migraines are back. My migraines, migraine. And I finally convinced her to go see my mom's doctor, Dr. Strax. He, you know, he works with this kind of thing I, that, that his groupie parties, they all talk about migraines like this is for you. She went to see Dr. Strax and then she, too, got better. And then when she came to our makeshift office the next day, she we all looked at each other and said, we got our idea. This is the idea. We got to help people. And then Eric kind of raises his hand and says, oh, by the way, I've had like RSI and all types of crazy mind body issues for like my whole life, last 30 years. We're like, oh, then you're you're one of us. Uh, let's do this together. <clears throat> and, and and that's when that question came up, that that founding hypothesis, which was, well, geez, it took me 15 years. It took Laura all this time and me convincing her. It's Eric was silent about it for 30 years. Um, why didn't we all know about this sooner? Why didn't we get this information sooner? And that was when we said, let's make that our mission essentially to get the information to people as 
as far and wide as possible, I assume. Cause I mean, that is, that's the same as this podcast. Um, I mean, I, I do have specific things that I have to say about it as well, but the bottom line is I could not believe how much I, I could have saved myself years of, of pain if I had just known. And, and I applaud you guys for doing this. And I know you, you've been incredible innovators in the field. In fact, I'm just going to, we're already starting to get some comments that are um, talking up curable. So I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them aloud. Um, we have one from Linda. She says, this painful story is making me smile because I know it has a happy ending. Uh, it is. It's much easier to listen to these stories when you know it has a happy ending. I have a lifetime membership with Curable. It's like a full-on support team at my fingertips 24-7. Clara is awesome. Yay, Linda. Yes. Yeah. And I, I don't know who Clara is, but she sounds great. And I have an idea of the kind of the kind of person and help that she would be. But I really, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward, John, to having future discussions about this, because I think one of the things we need to do in this field is to link up the people who are spreading the word together. Because now, obviously, we have to make sure our messages align in certain mm -hmm. ways. And if they don't figure out those, <laughs> those parts, but I think it really is important if we're going to change the national discussion, which is part of what I really want to do and certainly sounds like something you guys would want to do we do need to figure out how are we talking about this even when we talked about the terminology right. we don't we don't know what to call it even right. <laughs> um, right. so i'm going to want to hear more about how curable is is evolving and i'm going to get into that in a second i just want to read one one other um quote from a curable and sounds like a john strax groupie <laughs> <laughs> self, self Self-stated uh, groovy. This is Erin Levis. Um, she says, hi, Dr. Radner and John. It's a pleasure to see this conversation. Curable and curable groups have been a huge part of recovery for me in the past year, which is fantastic. And then her next is LOL to Strax groupie. I think I'd qualify as one too. So there's, and, and I, John, uh, John Strax, uh, I really like you too, John, but uh, the John I was referring to there is John Strax. There's so many good Johns here. John Sarno, John. Oh, Robin, no, I never John even Strax. really thought about that, but. <laughs> uh, you know, there's uh, Dan Buglio is someone in the field. So there are some other Dans here, but um, it's really good to hear people are finding you and they're utilizing you. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how do people interface with curable? What, what, what's the, what's the interface like? What, what experience are people having on it? It's evolved over the years. Um, you know, we've, if, if, if we, if we, like we said, our, if our mission was to kind of spread that um, information far and wide and, and not just as far as how big of a net we can cast, but also, you know, part of this is about, um, making it accessible, uh, meaning, you know, geographically accessible. So the, from the comfort of your phone or your home, um, from the design and feel of it, meaning, okay, actually, this is actually something I want to use, um, uh, from the step-by-step -step process for those who still have doubt or those who need more information, you know, and, and allowing people to take their time to go through that journey. So it is, yes, it's about, how wide of an audience um, we can get this information to, but it's also the the um, the way the information is delivered. Um, and so, so it's evolved over the years. At first, I would say that we thought of ourselves curable as a tech company with who made th that made an app, the curable app. Um, yep. It is it, it it's grown from there. I now think that we are a company who helps people with pain. Um, we have a variety of products. So some of them are software based. Some are not. Um, we have uh, lots of partners um, and friends like you and Dr. Strax and so many others who we you know will refer patients to or will give them a platform to kind of speak their message. Um, we have a variety of, you know, we're on a variety of social media platforms and um, and other and, and so much content we put out our our own podcast and we'll, we have two podcast shows and um, and so 
it's it's grown now to an organization that truly just helps people with pain in a variety of ways. Um, yeah. And and in doing so, that's also changed the way that we attract people onto the platform. Uh, having gone from you know a singular tech product, an app, and how do you get people into that app? To look, this is a bigger brand. This is a bigger platform. There's a lot more to offer here, and therefore people can come in onto that platform a lot of different ways. I think it's such a great point, and I'm I'm certainly finding the same thing that as I go. I keep expanding into kind of other areas or other ways of, of doing things. I'm developing these seminars that I'll do that may be similar to what John Strax does, but with my own, you know, element to them, because here's another thing that I'm sure you guys run into. Different people can afford different levels of treatment. They need different things. Some people benefit from individual work. Some people benefit from group work. Some people benefit from reading and resources. It's, it's so widespread what people need. And I, I really admire what you guys are doing. And I hear about you guys all the time and I've checked it out myself. So I know you guys are doing uh, good work. So here's what I like to do, John. I want to, I want to transition now into our Q and a, I may still have some questions for you if you will indulge me with that. Uh, right. If I get to fit them in, but if the questions are coming fast and furious, then I'll just have to have you on a separate time and, and uh, catch up to, with you more about it. But, Let's start with, uh, this is P to the at sign. This is his name, his name, Patrick. I've talked to Patrick before on crushing doubt. So welcome back, Patrick. I don't know if, uh, you, if you are familiar with curable, uh, or if you've ever talked to John or anybody at curable or Clara for that matter, but he says is all back pain TMS. So I'm just gonna pause there. TMS is tension myositis syndrome. That's what Sarno called mind body issues. As John and I mentioned, we use all kinds of different terms, but any term is allowed here. We're not saying no, no terms. We just, it's vague. Is all back pain TMS, especially if it's just mild to moderate pain after doing physical activity. Most TMS cases are described as severe pain. That's seemingly random. So let's both take this question. John, what would you okay. say to that? I, there's, I, as I was reading the question, um, I had three thoughts. If that's, I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, one is that the one thing that Curable, I think, does exceptionally well, perhaps better than any other brand or organization in the world, is to translate the incredible work that so many scientists and doctors have done around the world over the last 10 years or 40 years or 100 years about the brain's role in pain, uh, translate that into uh, content that, um, and, and deliver it in a way that people can actually use that's accessible. Right. What Curable doesn't do is um, make diagnoses. So we, I'm not a physician, and therefore when someone asks, is, is what I have, is that TMS or MDS, or is that this thing? Um, we usually say, uh, so literally hundreds of thousands of people use curable for that exact reason, but I can't tell you if yours falls into that category. Right. Right. So that's the stay first. away from that. Yep. The second thing is, um, I would say, no, not all back pain is TMS. N now getting uh, that disclaimer out of the way, not all back pain is TMS. I can think of many situations where back pain wouldn't be TMS, broken bones and, and car accidents and a lot of other things. Um, I, I think that there's research out there now showing us that a lot of back pain is centrally based, meaning brain based. So I would say a lot of it is based on the research. Um, and then the third point that I'm thinking about here is that if you have that, what, what um, Peter the at science calling TMS, but let's call it central pain or whatever it is, brain based pain, if you have brain based pain, it can come in all forms. It can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe. And I know this because I've had all varieties. And so, um, and, and we of course interact with thousands of people who are on all levels of the, are on all ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's a, a great and thorough answer. Well, very well done. So I'm gonna give you my take, uh, John and Patrick, and, and we'll just compare notes. So, my way of thinking about it is, first of all, I'm not a medical doctor myself. 
And so I, I don't immediately jump to everything is TMS or a mind body issue, but there's a lot of hallmarks for it that I feel comfortable making a diagnosis from a psychology standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that all depends on somebody having been to see an MD. I do want them to have seen a medical doctor because I don't know the body like a medical doctor does. Now, medical doctors also have certain ideas about the body like herniated discs cause back pain that we have seen. The research proves that is not true. And I'm sure that's all over curable. Uh, I know many of those studies myself. So what I would say, Patrick, is that there can be injuries, but those are caused by blunt force collisions. If you get hit by a truck, you can have back pain from that. That's not TMS. It's just like what John is saying. And you can even have it just in a more mild form. Let's say you're playing basketball and you catch an elbow to the back or something like that. You can have pain, but pain heals. That kind of pain heals. So if you're not, if you're not healing mm -hmm. and doctors have checked you out and they can't figure out what's going on, I would say... In that case, yes, the pain is going to be 100% mind-body uh, at that point. Uh, I see you nodding, John. Does that sound like something you would basically agree with? That's fair. That's fair, yeah. Okay. All right. So I want to address one other thing in the question, though, because he said most TMS cases are described as severe pain that's seemingly random. I don't know if you have found this, John, but in my experience, the more severe the pain is over a longer period of time anyway, the more likely it is to be a mind-body issue. It's it's something that's very interesting to me. It's something I like to highlight because mind-body issues are so powerful that they can be the most painful thing you've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Certainly was true mm -hmm. for me. So I just like to highlight that so that people don't think it can only be a moderate thing. It's actually, right. in some ways, totally the opposite. Patrick has a second question, though, we're going to get to. He says, uh, could you speak about the role of physical deconditioning in recovery? struggling to get back to normal activity, but I'm out of shape now and hard to tell how much is TMS versus mm -hmm. deconditioning. Mm -hmm. Now, I also should mention, he does say that he is a curable subscriber, so he obviously knows about you guys and he's hooked in and getting lots of good information from you guys. But John, I will let you take this first and then I'll give my answer. What a, it's, it's such a hard question to answer and it's even harder to actually go through that experience you know, that Patrick's going through because I've gone, I know it because I've gone through it myself. It is so hard to tell. It, it just is. I, I don't know if, that, if I can uh, make a blueprint for getting through it or um, accept to commiserate and say, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Like what, what, and here's my most concrete example. When I was getting through my, the end stages of my back pain, there's one thing I could not do in my twenties, which was I couldn't run a mile. I just wanted to run a mile. And, um, and so now I'm in my thirties, back pain's going away. And I, that's what I challenge myself to run a mile. Well, if you haven't run a mile in a decade and a half, you know, I don't, it's not the first, you know, it, it takes a little bit to get back into it. And, um, and, and, and so I would, I got this app on my phone that like you, you would run a little bit, then walk, it would kind of stage you along to condition you. And I would feel pain in my calf that, that actually ended up being a mind body thing. I would feel pain in my knee that wasn't, that was actually from deconditioning. It was a hard uh, transition. So uh, again, I think that um, to, to Patrick, take your time, try to take the stress out of it, try to take the fixation out of it. And like the, oh, what, you know, what is what, what is what? Let yourself be, um, just kind of come into it and, and take your time and give yourself a break on how quickly you get back into conditioning. I think that's, that's great advice as a great answer. And John, so here's, here's one of those times where it's possible, you know, you and I are just meeting today. So it's possible that some of the things I'm going to say you won't agree with, and that's okay. I think we'll, we'll have discussions about it, but uh, it could be that we will agree on it. So uh, I think it's great to have these discussions. So Patrick, here's what I would say about that. Um, first of all, I do commiserate in just the way John did. When I first did a push up, after all those years of back pain, my arms were shaking. I felt like I had just crawled out of a refugee camp and I felt physically ill. <laughs> and I would say that a lot of that was deconditioning or muscle atrophy. It just 
was, you know, body stuff. But the way that I've come to think about it that can be, I think, helpful for people, and this is why this this um, podcast is called Crushing Doubt, is that it's it's important to uh, to get to a point where you can get rid of the doubt where you can, because it's such a nebulous thing, just like you were describing, John. Here's that situation where Patrick's like, I don't know what is what. And mm-hmm. what the way I think about it that's helpful for for me and helpful for the people I work with is you don't need to worry too much about what's what. Because as you exercise, you'll get in shape. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you hurt yourself? And so I often say about a mind-body issue or TMS or whatever we're going to call it, it can hurt, but it can't harm you. Once you've figured out that it is a mind-body issue, you're not going to be in danger of hurting yourself. You could be extremely tired. You could have extra aches. You could have all kinds of things that do come up. And meanwhile, it's also a trigger for mind-body pain to go into these things. So Mm -hmm. a lot of doubt comes rushing in. What I like to encourage people about is try to fight through the doubt because if we already know it's a mind-body issue, if we've ruled out the medical and it's behaving like a mind-body issue, shifting around, coming and going, all the things we see in this, then you can proceed safely. So even if you have deconditioning, you don't need to worry about it. You're not going to hurt yourself. So that, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, and, and now, actually, Dan, I actually think that we um, we almost said two not opposing thoughts, but um, two parts of the same whole. And that mm-hmm. is when I was conditioning myself back into running, I, re- I recall this too, like it was yesterday. I was running along. I started feeling this pain in my Achilles. And I did the old, like, this is the Sarno recommendation of, you're not going to stop me. I kind of yelled at my Achilles, like, I'm, I'm going to plow on here. And guess what? I ran on and I felt great. And my pain went away and left me alone. And so I know exactly what you're saying. And I think that it's normal, I guess, to combine both of what we're saying. It's normal to feel confused and, and stressed. Um, And at the same time, like you're saying, um, it's also if you've ruled everything out, it's it's OK to start feeling more confidence in, in that that you can, you know, go. Absolutely. So, John, here's what we're going to do from now on, because we're getting lots of questions. That I want to fit in a bunch of them. Okay. If you feel like you want to jump in on a question, go ahead. And if I feel like I want to answer a question, I will. And we won't worry too much about whether we both touch on it. But um, first one is just an observation also from Aaron Levis. Um, I should add, I'm an anesthesiologist and didn't receive this information during my pain medicine training. That's 2002 to 2005. Mm -hmm. It was a glaring absence. Such a great point. I just wanted to thank you for saying that, Aaron, because if we're going to change this national dialogue, doctors are going to have to uh, start to incorporate this. We're going to have to reach out to doctors to help them incorporate it, to help them understand it. Because it's totally missing from most medical training. It's also totally missing from most psychological training. It's the weird thing. It's like the yeah. it's the in between that we need to work on. There's great research on that too that supports what Aaron's saying and what you're saying that um, that that's not learned in med schools. I, I do. I am optimistic, however. Um, I, I you know we we engage with a lot of healthcare providers primary care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, mental behavioral health specialists, uh, and more. There are, I mean, we have about, at this point, about 1,500 um, healthcare providers who refer their patients to Curable. And um, and that list is growing and they're all like, my, they all get it, you know? They might not have the right. words to communicate it to a patient. They might not have learned it in med school, but they do believe that there is a central, a major central brain component to persistent pain. So I think that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And that's great. And I think we've made huge progress. So we're going to get to another question. I just want to remind everybody out there, if you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing and put your comments below. I will respond to them personally. So this next question is from Paula Saslow. Hi, Dan and John. Hi, Paula. Uh, John, how much emotional work did you have to do to heal? Or were you one of the lucky ones where the awareness Sarna brought to you was the healing? So uh, um, Paula may not have heard the story before about how quickly you got better from Tony's conversation. 
but it may have been both like a leap forward. And then, so you, you take this one since she addressed it to you, obviously. Yes. Um, the initial improvement in my quality of life and symptoms was really about awareness and education it was about learning and about, you know, awareness led to reduction of fear, reduction of fear led to, you know, the symptom relief. That was my initial experience. Let's call that kind of phase one of John's uh, getting better in from back pain. But the, it's an ongoing experience. There's not, we like to say at Careball, it's not a destination. You don't just get rid of pain and that's it. Um, I'm still somebody who gets pain. I got, I had a back blowout uh, this past summer. And I'm, that's like the, you know, the cobbler's kid shoes type of thing. Like I, I'm, a member of a company that all we do all day is try to help people with, you know, chronic pain symptoms and with, you know, using brain-based techniques. And now I'm get getting pain again. Um, and at, in phase two, and I think the ongoing journey, my ongoing journey, it's all emotional. I had to, in order to get out of that back pain this past summer, it was emotional work that I had to do. It was, you know, COVID related and being in the house and kids and family and this and that and the other thing. Um, and, uh, and so, so it was, it, it transitioned for me. It was at first, it was an awareness thing for my initial improvement. And now it's become for my life maintenance, it's become an emotional thing. That's great. Okay. We're going to move on to Linda's question. Uh, Linda Elard, I hope I have your last name, right? If not, please correct me in any way. She says, <clears throat> let me jump on the Strax groupie, uh, train too. This is a Strax love fest. <laughs> or that. His empathy, intuitive compassion, support, and sense of humor really validated my experience and increased my appreciation of outcome independence. Um, and then she says, my pain is random and can be so severe that I want to jump out of my body and run away screaming. And I'm so sorry, Linda. John and I have both been in your shoes before and uh, we'll work at it. She says, it is very hard to reduce fear when it feels like you're being smashed with a hammer somewhere. Absolutely. I'm just going to make a comment about this, John, that Please my do. thinking is my thinking, Linda, is, first of all, absolutely. No one could possibly blame you for being afraid of that kind of pain. My back spasms were the most terrifying thing I ever experienced, short of, you know, really bad emotional trauma. But even that was its own emotional trauma. And that's the thing. This mind body experience can be its own trauma. One of the things that uh I can help you with or curable can help you with is to learn to be af less afraid of it by understanding what's happening, because then you can understand when does the pain come? Why does the pain come? If it's totally random, it's even more terrifying. So that, that's kind of my, my thought about it, but we can, we can work on that uh, as we go. Now we have a question from Sylvia Sierra. She says, I've been doing this work since June, and while I'm more productive, active, living my life more, I still have some kind of head migraine pain almost every day. It's very frustrating. Now she has a, a, a second part to it. I've had chronic migraine for four years, chronic tension head, uh, sorry, chronic tension type headache for 10 years before that. First of all, let me say, uh, again, I, I, whenever I hear any of these stories, I empathize greatly. John does the work he does. I do the work I do because we empathize with, with you guys so much. But I also do want to say headaches are something that is particularly hard. I don't want to downplay any other thing, but the headaches are so in your face and it can be extremely, extremely difficult. And so, John, let's talk about what uh, what thoughts we can give to Sylvia to give her encouragement that she can, you know, further the, further her her goals. It's is she is by far not alone in not only the feeling that she has of fresh of frustration, but in actually how long it's taking and you know from her perspective to to see improvement. Um, we look at our own data, which of which we have a lot, and it is we haven't yet. I can't say it doesn't exist, but we have not yet found a correlation, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of users. We have not yet found a correlation between, um, you know, almost intensity of work or, or duration of work time you put in. So let's call it the dosage. We have not seen a correlation between the dosage of the work 
and, and improvement. Um, hmm. And so, you know, we, we have so many, you know, users of the Curable app who kind of can look at education and uh, day one and start to feel improvement. And then so many folks who, after a year of work, they are feeling sim very similar to how they started, still feeling hopeful, still mm -hmm. quality of life aspects are improving, but symptoms aren't necessarily improving and still feeling hopeful and they carry on. So she's just, Sylvia is completely not alone. Absolutely not alone. I do want to add one thing that maybe can give you some hope, Sylvia, which is in my way of looking at things, if you haven't gotten better yet, and the and this goes with what John said, if the dosage isn't, you know, the amount of work you put in isn't determinant necessarily of the results, then we need, may need to look at something else. And And what my experience is, is that when you understand it to your satisfaction, this kind of goes with what I was saying, um, you know, when I was talking to Linda about the getting smashed with the hammer, when you understand things, that's when your nervous system can calm down. That's when the whole thing can change. So a lot of times it's about finding the riddle of what you're not understanding. And for me, this is one of the reasons I came to doubt as a subject is that the emotions weren't getting it done for me. I was a very aware person. I had been to years and years of therapy. I was like, how could I be having this pain? And what I found is I had so many questions, so many doubts. And John, I went to see um, Eric Sherman, who worked with uh, John Sarno. And I peppered him with like 200 questions in just one session. And that was so relieving to me. That's what I needed. So I would say, Sylvia, let's find out what you need. What what do you not yet feel like you've got the right answer to? And, and it needs to be answered to your satisfaction. And it's our job to try to do that. So help is on the way. Keep at it. Um, there's more to be more to learn. And it may just be that you don't have the information in the way that you need it yet. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, so let's go to Mark R's question uh, or observation. Let's see. It sounds crazy, but these podcasts are therapeutic. That doesn't sound crazy at all to me, Mark. I appreciate that. And that's, that's part of the goal. So thank you. And you are welcome. Are either of you keeping stats on how your treatments work? I know Sarno did some statistical analysis. Uh, I'll briefly say something about that. I am not, I am not a stats and research guy. I'm so appreciative of the people who are doing it. Um, Howard Schubiner does a lot of uh, this kind of analysis. He's working. I just uh, interviewed Dave Clark mm -hmm. out, uh, out in Oregon, and they have a, a a clinic in Las Vegas that is tracking these things. So these things are out there. I'm not doing it. I'm generally kind of keeping track of how many people I work with get better. And uh, the vast majority do. And the ones that don't, it's kind of like what I was saying to Sylvia. We just didn't hit on the right solution yet. Mm -hmm. John, what would you say about that? Yes. As a, as again, kind of having our DNA as a, as a technology company, um, we do are interested in data. Um, initially it was data. We collected data to improve the actual offering, you know, to improve the product. We would, interview our users we would look at this the analytics and say oh, what what features are people using what do they like what do they don't like what's helping them uh, over time we've we've turned that into we run we do have an run an internal study um and there have been about 7100 uh participants in that study and um and we evaluate how we're doing through that internal study that we run that's great. And uh, I want to say I'm so grateful that Curable's out there. I, I'm I'm so gr so grateful that Howard Schubiner is doing what he's doing, Dave Clark. Um, I, I think David Schechter is doing some work in that too. There's so many people in this field are doing that. So I just want to thank them. John, I want to check in with you about time because we're going strong here. We've got a lot of people following. We've got a lot of people asking questions. And if you have to, if you have to go somewhere, I want to be mindful of your time we said we'd do about an hour and we're coming up with five minutes left and we still have some time. Do you have some extra time to stay or do you need to run and we can bring you back another time? I do. I would, I'd love to answer questions and, you know, wh while we are on, I know there's always comments later, but you know, while, while we're yeah. on folks are engaged and I'm happy to stick around. The only caveat that you know, Dan is um, it's COVID I'm at home and uh, there was about right. 
half a snow in Denver yesterday and or last night. And so my kids are out on a snow day. So at any moment around here, but as long as you and yes. your audience are okay with that, then I am. I think, I think we'll be happy to roll with you on whatever you need. And if you need to run, you just let us know, but I'm glad you're, you're willing to stay because we're, we're getting a lot of good engagement. A lot of people want these questions. Um, a place to have these questions asked and to have us both here is I think really nice. Okay. So we're, uh, Linda's got another question. Let me make sure I'm in the right place for this. Okay. How can I mitigate my perfectionism to allow for self-compassion and forgiving myself for not recovering perfectly? I know this cognitively, but perfectionism is like a background app. app. Well said, Linda. And this is a, a big challenge. A lot of the people who suffer from these things do have a perfectionism streak. I, sh I certainly know I do. If I didn't, I'd be mad at myself because I would be imperfect. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I think, I'm glad you caught that, John. So <laughs> what can we say to her about this? Uh, my, my first inclination is to say, you know, it's easy for people to say, oh, forgive yourself or be self compassionate You've tried that. Um, to mm -hmm. me, the bottom line is, again, about understanding. If you can understand why you're not having self-compassion, that's a key factor. I'm going to give the, I'm going to throw this to John for a sec. And then, John, when you're done, I, I have one more thing to say about it. Go ahead. What, what would you say to Linda about this? Um, it's. The, you know, we, I think that what I would lean on in, in answer, responding to Linda would be our own, um, you know, the type of help that Curable in particular uh, offers to folks in this category. Um, we certainly acknowledge that it is a, a thing, that there's a connection there. And so we do have quite a few lessons in the Curable app on perfectionism, um, the Curable community. We have a, also a, an online community um that all you know app members can um join uh, it's a very positive uplifting community and perfectionism is a big topic there as well so um you know as far as being a subject matter expert on it i i am not so i would, I would kind of defer to you on that dan but i could um reference uh you know various content and, and things that can be done in, um, in the curable universe that's great. And so Curable is a great resource for it. I'll give you my take on it. Um, and, you know, there's all these different takes. So hopefully this can be a, an added thing in my in my way of working through things. I have I have these three columns, John. It's the emotions column, which tends to work a lot like Sarno does. But the, the doubt column is about articulating all the different doubts and making sure you understand what's happening. But then I have a third column, which is, I call the power column. And that's about your relationship with yourself. So when Linda brings this up, that's what it makes me think of is how do you work on your relationship with yourself? I have a video on, on how to build self-esteem in a quick way, in a mind body sort of way. And so what I work on Linda is to get to your core narrative. I think we've actually even talked about this somewhere on, on grudging doubt. Um, I try to get people to their core narrative, which is a new way of understanding the self that takes the main experience you had and looks at it through a truly empathic light. But sometimes you're going to need somebody else's input about that. And that's one of the things that I do in my work is to, I take the information that you're telling me and I retell you your story. And when you hear it from me, you will have empathy for yourself. So a lot of, and look, this is the basis of therapy, but I do it in this very quick way because of what I understand the, the body is telling us. So Linda, I do think there are ways to get past that that are actually better than than your average therapy. And I think a lot of the information on Curable helps. I think a lot of these groups help. You never know when it's going to click. It could click from somebody you're talking to in, in these chat rooms. It could click from something on Curable. It could click in something I say about the core narrative. What I would say is don't give up on it. You got to keep working towards finding your way of understanding it where you actually can forgive yourself and be self-compassionate. So there's help, and let's keep brainstorming about it. Let's move on to uh, Mark R. says, I feel like this is still an art. Oh boy, do we understand that? Yes. In general, we know things that work, but finding the exact thing that works for an individual is not perfectly defined. I still believe belief in the cure is key. John, what do you think? Well, your show is called Crushing Doubt, isn't it, man? Isn't that? It, yes, it is. <laughs> the belief that, yeah, I mean... <laughs> 
I have, my thinking has evolved on this um, topic and I don't know if it was right back then or right now or neither were right, but I will give you my opinion. Um, I used to think that belief was an essential ingredient. You, you def, it, in all cases, you needed to have belief um, to get better. I, I have evolved, I've seen enough stories now, and just anecdotally, I've, I've seen enough stories where um, full-fledged belief was not necessary for someone to experience belief. Yeah. Um, yep. so, you know, belief can also um, grow. You don't need, it doesn't, and again, in my opinion, it, there's not necessarily a chronological order to it where it's like, okay, I need to reach out. The belief meter needs to fill up to a, a hundred first, and then I begin my improvement. Sometimes it's a virtuous cycle. You experience a little improvement and you go, oh, I'm going to get a little bit more belief than a little improvement, yeah. a little bit more belief. So, um, and honestly, in the end, I don't even know that you can, I think you can experience full relief and still not have the belief meter at full. And I think that's yeah. probably the case for me. I'm still amazed when we hear all the stories we hear about, you know, curable users in our community. Like, really? Is that, how is that? Or in my own experience, like I said this summer when I had my issues, my back issues again, the first thing that let, that disappeared was my belief in this stuff. Right away, I was skeptical again. Right, right away, right. Give me an MRI, I, I, so, you know. And so I don't think, I don't think you need to have it all there in as far as belief to, to get better. But that's an opinion. Well, and, all over time. and it shows you that that um, when the belief can leave that fast, it shows you how fragile it is. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and that, that's why I feel like crushing down is so important. I had to be very, very strict with myself about, no, don't get into doubt or you will slip in. So, Mark, it is an art. Um, crushing doubt. And, and my way of doing it, it's my art on how to do it. And I lend it to people or offer it to people. And then they, f I have to work with them to find their art, their version of it. But I would say this, I think that I, I really agree with what John said. You do, you don't have to have necessarily full um, belief. What I think helps though, is feeling at peace with it in one form or another. So that could be from full belief, but it could be from feeling like you just understand it, or it could be from feeling, I don't need to understand everything. When you feel at peace in some way with this, it calms down the central nervous system, the whole physiology changes. So, But it is an art, and it's an ongoing art, and I encourage you, develop your art, believe in your art, and if you if you're finding that something's not working for you, talk to people about it. You talk to me about it, whoever. We're a community and we'll help, we'll help you find your way in your art. So, but I love, I love the way you phrase it. Okay. Linda has another statement. She says, thank you. Just your empathy reduces pain from not feeling alone in this. I think she was referring to something you said, John, but uh, hopefully you're getting empathy from me too, Linda. And I will happily give that. Randomness creates hypervigilance. It's like a beast leaping suddenly, uh, suddenly out of nowhere. Uh -huh. I try to breathe through it. I love that statement. Yeah. I love it. Um, John, what were you going to say about it? Some folks who think too, Linda, that randomness is a sign that you're okay. Um, some folks think that I don't know all of your, I don't have your chart in front of me. Um, but there are folks who say that use randomness as a clue that this is your brain at work. Um, because if it wasn't, if, if it was structural, it would be more constant or more consistent. Oh, I, that's a great observation. So I, 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 I have to write that down. Is full stories, but, um, but some would say that, that random, you know, use randomness as a, as a, as a piece of evidence uh, that, that you're okay. If you, if that, that, you know, you've ruled everything out. Well, that's great. It's a great statement, John. I, I really, I'm going to hold on to that one because, um, you know, the mind has lots of ways of being random. We're all such unique individuals. And if you think about it, your associations, they can go just anywhere. So randomness can be a sign that you have a mind-body issue. Mm -hmm. If you have a mind-body issue, you're actually safe. You're not necessarily safe from pain, but you're safe from danger. 
Mm -hmm. And so that can start to kind of calm things down. But I, I will say this. Another thing that I work on in the doubt department is I believe that none of it's random. Now, that doesn't mean that you can always get to what it is. But mm. I have a system that tries to make it as non-random as possible. Mm. And even if you can't get to it, I, I like to have a system in place where people can feel like they can understand what, what happened. Because it seems random. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah. It, it seems random, but it's not. It's like, you know, I'm a psychologist. I can analyze dreams. Those aren't random either. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're totally weird. And there are times where I can't tell heads or tails or what it is. But they're not random. They're telling us something. So I, Linda, I'd say one last thing is that um, I think that Sarno talks about symptoms as a distraction away from emotions. I'm not saying that's not true. I think that is true. But they're also a communication. And so that randomness is actually a communication. Okay, let's get to Janice Wright's question. Is there a correlation between age and healing? Uh, John, I'm going to let you take this first because you guys have done some great research on this. I don't know what you do know about that, but you probably know a lot. Not that, not that we've seen. Um, I think that there is a theory out there um, that, you know, the longer you've had your symptoms, the harder they are to unwind. Um, I think that that is better messaging to a patient than it is true. Um, meaning, you know, if a patient has had fibromyalgia for 25 years and then after two weeks they go, I, I'm not feeling better. What should I be doing this work anymore? It's kind of a good reinforcing message to say, just think of how long you've had the problem while you're thinking about how long it takes to get rid of it. But as far as what we, as far as data we've seen, stories we've heard, um, there is not a correlation between how long you've had the pain and healing nor age or healing. Um, we have the best stories of 80 somethings who, um, you know, are, are, are working on it, working on it to get better and get better. And then, you know, their lives are, are changed for the better. So yeah, I, I, I don't, we have not, that, not that we've seen. Yeah. I would just add that if, if there was a correlation between age and healing, what we would see is, 80 and 90 year olds, just everybody getting worse and worse and worse in a very uniform way. So I think that seeming randomness actually does make sense. And what, what makes sense of it is that there isn't a correlation between age and healing. There, there's a, a correlation. Like if you get a cut and you're an 18 year old, you're like Wolverine, you get better, much faster, but that's about injuries, but about this stuff. No, I, I don't think there's a correlation. A Facebook user, by the way, said, like this guy. I think he's talking about you, John, but he might be talking about me. I don't know. He left in general. So thank you. It's probably you. <laughs> okay. Sylvia Sierra says, uh, thank you so much for your response. If there's time, one thing I'm still confused about, it seems like it's overwork slash stress that triggers migraines for me more than emotions. She's got a second part to this. So I'm going to read that, but it feels like I have to limit myself so much to not quote unquote overwork like only three hours of work a day with lots of breaks and naps in between. Wow. Uh, I, I'm always blown away when I read these things and, and uh, it just fills me with empathy for each person that is suffering from this. There, There's what, like a hundred million chronic pain sufferers in the U S something like that, yeah. 80 to a hundred somewhere in there. So there's just so many people suffering from this. So John, what do we say? What do we say to Sylvia about this? What are your thoughts on that? If I were with having a dialogue with Sylvia, I would ask her, I, I'm, I'm reading the text here and it, it says, um, it seems like it's stress that triggers migraines, not emotions. And I guess I would ask her what she believes the difference is between stress and emotions. Um, yeah. Because I, I personally believe they are really closely related, if not one and the same, that stress, the feeling of stress is an emotional response to your busyness, your work, your, you know, whatever that is. So um, <clears throat> that's what I would ask Sylvia. And maybe because we're not having a dialogue, I could say, maybe look, look at it from that perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also would say, Oh, go ahead, John. I didn't no, no, look at it from that perspective period, please. <laughs> okay. So I, I was also thinking, you know, sometimes you can also have emotions about stress. So it is good to, to 
delineate, well, what, what's stress and, and what are emotions? But what I like to do is get at the heart of the matter. What's at stake? You know, so what does this stress mean for you? Some people would say it's stress, but really when they think about it, it means I'm never going to get out of this. And that's mm -hmm. danger. That's a sense of danger. So what I would encourage you, Sylvia, is to translate the stress into an emotional experience. It's very similar to what John's saying, but <laughs> roundabout way of saying it. Um, now, then she says, but it feels like I have to limit myself so much to not overwork, like only three hours of work a day with lots of breaks and naps in between. And I think that that's what I would say is that's fear. It's a very understandable fear. It's a conditioned fear. You have that experience that you do have a, a, an issue. So you use the word trigger, Sylvia. I think that's a great word for it. It's a word I use a lot. Um, it's kind of like we were talking about with um, being deconditioned before. You're going to have to work through certain triggers, scary things. When I first got back onto the basketball court, it was one of the most terrifying things I ever did. Because I was like... I. I don't know. I mean, I'm in a much better place now, but I have to actually go and do the thing. And I think what you're saying, Sylvia, is when you're working, you have a trigger each and every time and, and you have to work to believe you can do it. And maybe little by little, like John was saying, you gain a little more confidence when you went, let's say an extra 15 minutes <laughs> and an extra half an hour and you build up, not physically, but in, in the mind. Uh, Facebook user says, stay warm. All right, we'll do our best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Linda says, do you think the peer-reviewed research studies will hasten the tipping point to get this persistent pain paradigm into the mainstream? Well, that is the question on all of our lips. John, what do you think? I think it will be a confluence of factors that uh, get this paradigm into the mainstream. I think that research, of course, helps with a certain segment or you know part of the global market the chronic pain market um but i don't think it will be that's not a you know magic bullet uh that will all, you know the three randomized clinical trials that favor this come out and now the whole world knows about it and prescribes it and insurance companies cover it and patients ask for it and everything else um i think that it will be more multifactorial I, I agree with John on that. I, I think it's a very important part of it, though. Mm -hmm. And we want we want to push forward with all of these things. But, you know, it's going to be there will be a tipping point. You know, we see this all the time in the country with various things or in the world where suddenly something is more acceptable. That wasn't. And it's a tipping point. Maybe it's more people, you know, know this. Right. So many more people know right. about Sarno than did when I was looking at it. So I would say we are building towards that tipping point. And we're going to keep the pressure on. <laughs> Curable's doing it. Crushing Doubt's doing it. And we'll we'll keep at it. Yeah, I actually I uh, really believe it'll happen in my lifetime. And I'm 41, so um, I got you know. I hope I have some years left. But I, I just think it will. Like I'm not. We're not talking 100 years here. I think it's that. I agree. Point. I agree. I, I I mean, I think in 10 years we we may not be at that tipping point, but we'll be a lot further along. I agree. Uh, a couple Facebook users commenting, John is the best. Oh. This time I know they're talking about you. <laughs> it <is>. uh, <laughs> it's a love fest. Another Facebook user says, I'm a big perfectionist, but lately I have been slacking for some reason. What do you recommend? Uh, that's that's a great uh, it's a great question. And I was thinking about this in relation to meditation. Sometimes I get in habits where I'm meditating regularly and then I start to slack. Why? The main thing I would say about it is check in with yourself about whether you are kind of punishing yourself in a way. Are you are you not feeling good about who you are at the moment? So then you secretly punish yourself in some way. What you want to do is think about, you know, slacking is something that speaks to the fact that you're having some kind of emotional response. So go yeah. within, figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, what were you going to say, John? No, I think it's, I, that's, I think, wonderfully said that the, the word slacking, the feeling of slacking is an emotional response and, and, and yeah. kind of digging in there and seeing what's going on. Right. And even the phrase slacking is a, it's a self-negative yes, statement. Right. right. And so you got to remember to be kind to yourself. One thing I recommend is to be fiercely in your own corner. That means go to that core self you have 
as if you're a little kid. Would you be that hard on you as a little kid? I sure hope not. Using the little kid version of yourself is a very useful uh, method to, you know, get get to a more forgiving, nice place to yourself. I just want to remind the viewers out there, if you haven't already, to click subscribe, hit like if you like what you're hearing, ring the bell for notifications, and put your comments below. Um, John, I have a lot of uh, useful follow-up messages that I get to people, and I really do respond, and I'm sure you guys are swamped with that at Curable. So, um, okay, we have Linda again. John, thank you for that. Uh, and Dan, two sides of the same coin. The pain ping-pongs around randomly, but the core cause is not at all random, even if I haven't nailed it yet. So helpful. I'm glad it was helpful. I really do think it is. it's really important that we get the idea of randomness out random theories are what doctors are actually giving about these things <laughs> where they're like, Oh, you randomly had this pop up now, you know, like the car accident for yeah. at 14, that, that, that explained your pain, hmm. you know, years later, randomly then, um, what I like about the work that I do and the work curable does is it's not random. It's science and it's logic. Okay, Sylvia Sierra says, if people are on Twitter, I have a mind-body research list you can follow. That's great. Uh, Dan and Curable are on it. Thank you, Sylvia. That's Curable. fantastic. Curable has great has a great Instagram presence, but could have more on Twitter. All right. Little tip for right. you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. All right. Linda says, I have had pain-free days back-to-back -back with severe pain days. People think I'm nuts but I really am convinced it's my brain playing whack-a-mole with me. Boy, that's, that's a really great way of, of representing it. I think we've all experienced that. John, I'm, I assume you have any comments for, for Linda on that. I, I, I mean, it sounds like she know she's on, she's on to the, onto it, you know, um, <laughs> I would say, you know, just, yeah, trust your suspicion <laughs> is what I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, uh, again, a plug for don't think it's random because you're going to have your days. That's actually some of what I lay out in my my plans for things. These different columns is there's a way to look at emotions to find out, am I am I having something in that? And if it's not that, then I skip over to the doubt column. If it's not that, I skip over to the power column. And if I don't find it in any of the three, I do it all over again because there is something there. There's something to understand about it. So uh, but I do think that a lot of times a mind body, uh, the psychological defense of the mind body issue is trying to get you fooled. It's trying to get you to doubt again. And that's something that, that you know, you really want to look out for. Janice Wright says, thank you both. Another thoughtful uh, intervention, Dan. Nice to see John again. And then I actually saw later she meant, oops, interview. So not, not intervention, interview. So I appreciate you watching, Janice. Let's open it up to any last questions that people might have. John, I want to thank you for spending extra time with me today. It's it fun. Was, yeah. uh, I'm happy to, we're here to help people. So if this is helpful, then uh, I'm happy to stick around a few more minutes. Well, I really appreciate it. Uh, Sylvia says, thank you both so much for your time and your empathic responses. I think it's the least I can do um, given what these ideas gave to me completely saved my life this is the least I can do. And it's, a, it's such a pleasure to do it. And I, I know I have a kindred spirit in John in that, in that regard. So if there are any last questions, fire away. And uh, we, we can probably take another, another one or two questions. Um, so let's see if anything comes up, John, but I did want to say, this has been such a pleasure talking to you, hearing your personal story. And I, I've known about curable, but I think it's so nice to have a, a personal connection to someone there and understand what it is that you guys are trying to do. I applaud what you're doing. Um, Aaron Levis has a question. She says, John, are you hiring? Exclamation point with laughing. Yes, we are. Uh, huh? we're, we're currently hiring. Um, you know, we hire various positions all the time, but right now what we're hiring for is a, um, a software engineer. So, if you, Aaron, or anybody you know uh, is a great software engineer um, and wants to join the Curable team, then please let us know. And I will say, you know, this is this is a growing uh, community that I think will be hiring or training lots of people. We we want to we want to really get this right. And John, I'm going to take this one uh, question from Linda, and then we'll wrap up here. She says, you two are a great duo. I personally agree. <laughs> uh, 
Insurance coverage would make this available to so many persistent pain sufferers who are tracked towards injections and surgery because it's covered. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of what we've got to work on. Yes. Um, we're, and we're, that's we're, why we're, we're working yeah, on it. Go ahead. Say yeah. what you're going to say about it, John. Yeah. Well, I've just, I agree with Linda. Uh, there's a financial accessibility piece to all of this. Um, that's core to what Curable is doing. Uh, you know, um, we offer our, you know, flagship uh, product is a curable app, and we've just reduced, reduced, reduced price over time um, because of that, because we know that folks need to gain access and money's a factor. Um, but we'd love to see it be and cost nothing to the, you know, the people who use it. We know insurance is a big part of that, and we are currently actively working on that. Um, with insurance partners, with state uh, governments, um, using data, using pilot, you know, doing uh, pilots and partnerships with, with a number of folks. So something we're aware of and something we're working on. And, and I'm, I'm actually quite confident that we'll, we'll get there. So stay tuned. I, and the only thing I would add is we're trying to change the national discussion in so many ways, but when we get to that tipping point, that will change if it hasn't already. Or maybe that's the thing that will get it to change. So we're going to keep working on that. Um, I'm going to just take one last question, John, and then I'll let you run, though. I so appreciate your time. This is Patrick again. Does the thyroid play a role in mind-body issues? Any research on this? Thanks for answering my prior questions and doing this session. John, Any? do you have any sense of research on the thyroid and whether it plays a role in mind-body issues? Yeah, I don't, I don't specifically have... Um uh information or research on that on the thyroid in particular i can um recommend that patrick become a, a john strax groupie because um dr strax has a, a strong thyroid practice as well as a strong obviously you know mind body pain practice and so if patrick wants to talk with an expert on how those two things interrelate i would strongly recommend dr strax that's great and so let Let's all keep talking together. John, I really want to thank you for coming on here. Thank you, Dan. This it, has been it, fun. It was great. It was great. And I, I'd really love to team up with you on future things. We're, we'll put our heads together about what we might be able to do together. We're a great, we're a great duo. As, we're a great duo. Yeah. You know, as and somebody, somebody, <laughs> one of us guys. So, hey. We got at least that going. No, I, I, I really felt that. And I'm not surprised because we're, we're kindred spirits. We've had these similar experiences. So hopefully we'll have more collaborations to come, maybe more of these even. We can talk about it. But John, fun. thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to the audience too, folks who are watching live and folks who are watching on replay. I appreciate everyone's engagement Absolutely. being here with you. Absolutely. The, the audience out there, you, you, you're making this happen every bit as much as we are because the demand being there really does help. So we're happy to help in any way we can. Again, if you haven't uh, already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications and put your comments below. And uh, John, let's, let's reach out to each other and connect on all this. But thank you again for coming on. My pleasure. Good to see you. You too.